Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. I'm glad those lights back there aren't on it because if I could really see how many people were back there, I'd probably be a little bit on the nervous side. <clears throat> it's a privilege to be up here. I almost feel like I'm home. I was born and raised in uh, southern Iowa, and uh, it's good to be back up here, and we really appreciate the work that the uh, group up here has done in putting together this, uh, this meeting. People say to me, oh, I know what you do out there at that Van Andel Creation Research Center. You try to prove the Bible, don't you? And I say, no, I don't try to prove the Bible out there at all. The Bible's true whether I can prove it or not. What we're trying to do is we're trying to answer some legitimate academic questions and intellectual questions that, on the age of the earth and the age of the, uh, uh, age of the universe and the origin of the Grand Canyon and the origin of kaibab squirrels and, uh, and the uh, uh, rate of stalactite growth and the rate of incoming meteors and uh, the limits of variation and uh, limits of natural variation in the genesis kinds. Our research center is in Chino Valley, Arizona, so I want to bring you uh, greetings from the 650 scientists of the Creation Research Society that operates the uh, Van Andel Creation Research Center. Some people say, why do you call it the Van Andel Research Center, Van Andel Creation Research Center? And that's in honor of Jay Van Andel, who provided the funds to build the, uh, the, uh, the facility and still continues to help us out uh, considerably. Jay Van Andel is a co-owner of Amway Corporation. And he said in, a, in an interview in the Grand Rapids Press not very long ago, his goal was to give creationists a fighting chance. And, uh, you know, we're not playing on a level playing field out there, folks. <laughs> Some of you are aware of that by now. And uh, we really appreciate uh, the, the kind of support that churches have given us, individuals have given us, Christian foundations have given us down across the, uh, the years to make this all possible. Chino Valley is, up, is in uh, north central Arizona. Some people t ask, well, what's Chino Valley like out there in Arizona? And I tell people that Chino Valley is the one town in all Arizona where all real Arizona cowboys want to end up. If you're a real Arizona cowboy, you want to end up in the 7,000, part of the 7,000 people in Chino Valley. But I have to tell you that being a cowboy in Chino Valley, Arizona, has nothing to do with cows. It doesn't even have anything to do with horses. It has everything to do with pickup trucks. Now, if you're a real Chino Valley cowboy, you've got a pickup truck. And you can usually tell, the, and it's not just any pickup truck, okay? It's, it's usually a king cab. It's got a drink holder in the dash, a, a, a 30 odd 6 hanging in the window, and two dogs in the bed. Now, the two dogs in the bed are the real mark of the Chino Valley cowboy. When we first moved to Chino Valley, we went into the bank. Through the, drove through the drive-in at the bank. And every place else I'd ever been, when you drove into the drive-in at the bank, uh, when you finished, when we had little kids, there, there was a jar there with suckers in it for the kids. Not in Chino Valley. You know what we've got in Chino Valley? Jar with dog bones in it. So, <laughs> well, at any rate, <clears throat> Creation, Creation Research Society, six, 600 scientists, for biblical creation. The evolutionists don't like that. The evolutionists like to tell us that uh, there are no scientists that are creationists and there are no creationists that are scientists. In our local um, college, they teach a course called Science and Pseudoscience in the Modern World. And on several occasions, the professors of that course have had me come in and speak to the students as an example of a pseudoscientist, <laughs> which has always been sort of interesting because it's uh, uh, mostly... Uh, probably an average uh, 40, 45, 50 uh, age group. And uh, every time the students come up to me and say, thank you for coming. We have never, ever heard that there's an alternative to the theory of evolution. We've got a lot of work to do, but we've made a lot of progress. Well, my talk tonight is going to be on a biologist looks at origins. And there's one particular aspect of the issue of origins that I want for us to take a look at. And this has to do with the issue of the fact of the faith-based nature of evolutionary thought. You know, the evolutionist likes to tell us and likes to tell the public that evolution is science and creation is religion. Well, folks, I want to tell you that it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. And this was one of the first hints that I had when I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa that something was drastically wrong 
with the theory of evolution because I began to see that it was more of a philosophy and more of a worldview and more of a religious faith than it was of hard science and hard evidence. Now, why does it take more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation? Let's look at the origin of life for a minute. Charles Darwin, I think it was, put forth this idea of the warm little pond scenario. And the scenario goes something like this. Perhaps there was a warm little pond someplace millions, perhaps billions of years ago, where life by natural processes could come into existence and be nurtured over a period of time so that it could begin to develop and reproduce and mutate and eventually form into a large number of different types of organisms. So we want to talk about the origin of life scenario for a little bit. We want to talk about the problems associated with it, and we want to talk about the improbability of the origin of life scenario, and then we want to talk a little bit about the religious nature of the origin of life scenario. Now, what's the, what's the improbability issue? There is a fellow by the name of Fred Hoyle, who's an astronomer, who has made the following statement. And I think it's very instructive to, he's not, an, he's not a creationist, he's an evolutionist, but he has serious problems with the origin of life. So I want, uh, uh, by natural processes on Earth. So I want us to take a look at a quote from Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle says something like this. He says, the, probability, the trouble is that there are more than 2,000 different independent enzymes necessary to life and the chances of getting them all produced by a random trial is less than 10 to the minus 40,000th power. Now, to put that in a little bit simpler terms, that's one chance out of 10, followed by 39,999 zeros. Now, I was um, on a Christian television station one time, and I made the mistake of saying this was one chance out of 10 followed by 40,000 zeros. And I got a nasty letter from a mathematician <laughs> who said, no, that's not right. You've got to withdraw. You've got to pull this program off the air because he made this stupid mistake. And it, it was a mistake. It, I did 10 TV programs in two days, and that was... Uh, uh, my mind went a little bit muddled on that. So I wrote him back in that letter, and I said, okay, you're absolutely right. And I told him that, you know, I'd taught math at the college level, and so I was kind of aware of some of these things. But I said, do you really feel any more comfortable about your evolutionary faith? If it's one chance out of 10 followed by 39,999, rather than one chance out of 10 followed by 40,000? Now, to, get, to put that down on a little bit lower level, Let's just consider what these probabilities are. You say, how big of a number is 10 followed by 39,999 zeros? Well, it has been estimated that there's something like 10 followed by 73 zeros. That's how many atoms there are in the entire universe. Folks, we're not talking about one chance out of 10 followed by 73 zeros. We're talking about one chance out of 10 followed by 39,999. And he goes on to say, this minute probability of obtaining all of the enzymes only once each could not be faced, even if the entire universe consisted of organic soup. Folks, the probability of life originating by natural processes in a primitive environment is so vanishingly small that it can consi be considered to be an absolute total impossibility. A fellow by the name of Hubert Yockey, who has written a, an outstanding book on information theory and molecular biology. Hubert Yockey is one of these amazing individuals that's at home in two separate fields that intersect information theory and molecular biology. And he has looked at this quote from Hoyle, and he says, Hoyle is very, very optimistic, <laughs> even at 10 to the minus 40,000th, 1 out of 10 to the minus 40,000th power. Now, you say, why is this a, what is the religious significance of this? Well, Hoyle in his book on information theory and molecular biology, or Yockey in his book on uh, information theory and molecular biology, says the following. 
he says, to ascribe causality to an extremely rare event is the same as belief in miracles. Now, if you told somebody that you believed in miracles, they would say to you that that was a faith proposition. I say to people, now, wait a minute. Do you, when I'm speaking, particularly when I'm speaking in churches, I like to, I like to uh, uh, quiz the people a little bit and say, well, if it's one chance out of ten followed by 40,000 zeros, I said, how many are 39,999 zeros? I said, how many of you would believe in any event that improbable? And everybody shakes their head. But I say, well, now, wait a minute. What's the probability that a man could die? And three days later, after every cell in his body was disintegrating, be brought back to life. I would guess that's probably one chance out of ten followed by 39,999 zeros. Now, when I make that statement, that's a religious statement, isn't it? Folks, let me ask you, if that is a religious statement, and if these probabilities are even remotely accurate regarding the origin of life, when your kids are in the public school system and they are taught that life originated by random processes from some primeval soup, and the chances are one chance out of ten followed by 39,999 zeros, is that science or is that faith? Is that not a state-supported religion supported by your tax dollars? Yaki goes on to say, it is clear that belief, that the belief that a molecule of protein could appear, could appear by chance is based on what? Scientific evidence? Experimentally verified data? No. He says that is based on faith. And I would have to tell you that Yaki is an evolutionist. Now, he doesn't believe that life originated by natural process. He, he believed that once it started, that it could evolve on up. So he is clearly an evolutionist. But he says it's clear that belief that a molecule of protein could appear by chance is based on faith. It would seem that there's a religious side to the theory of evolution that we perhaps haven't considered as strongly as we might. Let's talk about the evolution of life. Once we get life originated, Let's talk about the religious nature of, of evolution in the evolution of life. And we want to talk about evolutionary trees, and we want to talk about the problem of dotted lines. <laughs> now you say, wait a minute, dotted lines, that's graphics, that has nothing to do with science. Well, let's see. We're going to do this in vertebrate evolution with vertebrate evolution in general, and then we're going to talk about dinosaur evolution. Well, here's the evolutionary tree. <clears throat> It is usually drawn something like this. Uh, starts out down here uh, uh, three and a half billion years ago with the first organism coming into existence. And across vast periods of time, life mutates, is naturally selected, and begins to diversify until finally here we are up here today with millions and millions of species of plants and animals. And this evolutionary tree I submit to you is being taught to students at a younger and younger age. Not only several years ago, my grandson called me up on the telephone. He's in the second grade at that time. He said, Grandpa, is it really true that whales used to live on land? I said, John Paul, you and I have got to have a long talk. <laughs> There's some problems here that you're not aware of. But you see, that's the nature of the evolutionary tree. In fact, the philosophical implications of the evolutionary tree, if the evolutionary tree is true, folks, then you are genetically related to every plant and animal that ever lived on the face of the earth. Not too long ago out in Arizona, I was at a meeting where there were some radical environmentalists and, um, and some not-so-radical ranchers. <laughs> And uh, they were discussing the issue of grazing rights out on the uh, public, uh, public lands. And one individual got up and he said, the field mice out on Baker's Pass have as much right to exist as we do. Now, you know what my first thought was? It was that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. 
And then I began thinking, no, not for this individual. Because, you see, the person who made that statement was president of the Prescott Humanist Society. And what do humanists believe? And what do all secular evolutionists believe? They believe that we are all genetically related. Two weeks ago, I was hiking in the John Muir Forest up in California. John Muir said something to the fact that all life had an equal right to live. Humans and bacteria. I don't know whether he ever brushed his teeth or not, but can you just imagine... Can you just imagine the philosophical implications for a person like that of brushing their teeth? I mean, you know, a hundred billion bacteria must bite the dust every time you do that. So, uh, but at any rate, this, this is the implication of, of the evolutionary tree. The evolutionary tree, taken to its logical conclusion, folks, means that we are no better than any other living organism. And that is being worked out. You may not see it here, but that is being worked out in a lot of the environmental and the, the, what is called the deep ecology movement in the, in the United States today. Because that deep ecology movement has its roots back into Eastern mysticism. And the deep ecology movement that is based on the Gia hypothesis and the Mother Earth idea and the idea that there's some sort of a super consciousness that is controlling everything in a mystical Near Eastern sense is pervading the whole issue of ecology and range resources and natural resources in the western part of the United States, and I'm sure that it's true in other parts of the United States as well. Well, there's the evolutionary tree. Let's look at the evolutionary tree a little bit closer. Here's an evolutionary tree of the vertebrates. This is an evolutionary tree that I was taught at the University of Iowa. I, was the, uh, I taught the uh, Comparative Anatomy Laboratory for three years at the University of Iowa. And uh, we used a book by a guy by the name of Alfred Romer. Romer was considered, and he came up with this evolutionary tree, Romer was considered to be the finest vertebrate paleontologist in the world. Now, this is Alfred Romer's evolutionary tree, and it's very instructive to look at it. Up here we have the jawless fish, the cartilaginous fish, the bony fish, the amphibians, the reptiles, and the mammals. Over here are the technical names for all of these different organisms. Class, by Monday morning I want you to have these memorized. <laughs> well, no, not really. All you really need to know is mammals, reptiles, amphibians, bony fish, cartilaginous fish, and jawless fish. And here is the the distribution through time, the abundance through the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Tertiary times. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you this question. What holds Alfred Romer's evolutionary tree together, class? What do we call these structures here and here and here and here and down here and here and here and here? What are those called, class? Dotted lines. Now, wouldn't it be interesting if we knew what those dotted lines in Alfred Romer's evolutionary tree really means? Incidentally, your young people will not be shown, by and large, will not be shown evolutionary trees with dotted lines. They will be shown evolutionary trees as with the previous evolutionary tree, as if all the branches were firmly connected and when you where every one of them comes off. <clears throat> 